welcome to the September 2015 episode of Risk Studio. I'm Manoj Kulval and I'm the co-founder and chief risk officer at Risk Spotlight. Risk Studio is a bi-monthly podcast on risk management topics. In each episode, I interview a risk management expert on one to two key risk management topics so the viewers can benefit from their knowledge and are able to take away some practical ideas back to their day-to-day risk management activities. In this episode, I will be interviewing Peter Moore, who is an enterprise analyst and consultant at Moore Limited, and he's joining us today from UK. Peter engages as management consultant with ambitious and growth-oriented businesses, which gives him a very unique perspective on different types of uncertainties such businesses face. In today's episode, Peter is going to share a new methodology and tool he has developed. This is based on the bowtie analysis technique, which is widely used within the risk management community. I became aware of his methodology when he recently shared the details in few LinkedIn groups. When I reviewed his methodology, what struck me was that his methodology was bringing some fresh thinking in the area of managing opportunities. Typically, risk managers dedicate all or majority of the bandwidth on managing threats and thus ignore the key aspect of risk in form of opportunities. Opportunities also have uncertainties associated with them and hence the risk management concepts and processes should also be applied to them to increase the likelihood of organization being able to achieve their objectives. So I'm excited about inviting Peter to this episode and facilitating the sharing of his methodology with you. So welcome Peter to today's episode. I will now hand over the virtual stage to you. Thank you, Manoj, and thank you, Risk Spotlight, for giving me this opportunity to talk about um, my, what I call, new method, um, which in principle involves reversing the bow tie model or the bow tie diagram. Uh, so this uh, presentation is called From Bad to Good, and that will be self explanatory in a moment. Okay, so in order to talk about um, reversing and changing uh, the bow tie method um, in order to look at upside risk, which is my focus. Um, I think we just need to firstly just uh, refresh ourselves on the four principles of of the bow tie method, um, because this is the basis from where I started my uh, new development. Um, so most of the listeners to the podcast will be familiar with bow tie diagrams, but maybe not everybody. There are variations in the way that these are produced, um, and I um, tend to use the version which is uh, most commonly uh, adopted by the safety engineering community, which is where I was uh, introduced to the bow tie method. Um, so in principle, uh, at the beginning, at the centre of your model you would have a what I call a bad event, because I like to use very simple language. Um, uh, in the engineering community, it's sometimes called the loss of control moment. But in principle, it's just the thing that you don't want to happen. Okay, um, And on the left-hand side of that diagram, you would have either causes or threats. The terminology does vary sometimes, but um, I prefer to stick to cause. Um, and on the right hand side of your diagram, you would have the effects, which because it's a bad event, they would be negative consequences typically. <clears throat> so we have a standard cause and effect diagram there. Um, but on the bow tie diagram, you, you, you are expected to uh, show where the controls cur- are currently in place and their status. Um, so this is obviously the key really to the diagram because it does help to explain your current um, environment. So the controls might indicate their status, how well they're performing or how uh, effective they are. Um, and that's a sort of s- standard classic bow tie diagram as I understand it. Um, and it didn't take me long to realize that maybe, maybe this could be used in a different way. Um, because I was interested to know how we could apply this in the world of business consulting, uh, management consulting, 
more positive approaches to uncertainty, um, business success, that sort of thing. Um, whereas this model is really focused upon the downside of risk, the things that can go wrong. So this was a thought experiment in effect, which was changing the perspective of the diagram from bad to good. Um, so, I, so I just thought, well, if I put a good event in the center of the diagram, what happens to the diagram? And this sort of ended up um, developing this concept that I call positive risk. I'll keep it in quote marks there because um, people can get quite passionate about these sorts of this sort of language. Um, however, I will explain where that uh, expression came from. Okay, so just a few couple of slides, really a bit wordy, just to explain the the, the sort of theory behind. Uh, behind my model and also for some of the language that I've been using. Um, so we're familiar with this idea that risk is the effect of uncertainty on objectives. Um, <clears throat> now that, that statement itself contains a heck of a lot of meaning. Um, so because quite clearly uh, it means that the probability of a risk event must be greater than zero and less than one because if you have uh, a probability of zero or one, they must, that implies that they're certainties and, and risk management is about uncertainty. So, so once we've established that, then we know that the probability of a risk event is always a positive number. Um, zero is not a positive number, but anything above zero is. So, so that's quite simple, that's straightforward. The word positive has now uh, entered the language <coughs> of this presentation. So if probability is always a positive number, and we start to apply it to the classic risk equation, which is, I, I put here as risk equals probability times outcome. When I started to work in risk assurance, uh, we, we used um, risk equals uh, likelihood times impact, which is fine. I think probability is a slightly better word than likelihood, um, and also impact, possibly has more of a negative connotation, whereas outcome is a little bit more neutral. So I like that particular uh, wording there of the risk equation. Now, um, that implies, so if the, if the probability is always a positive number, then the risk must be negative if the outcome is negative, and it must be positive if the outcome is positive. So I, so I now use these two expressions, negative risk, positive risk, to relate to these two scenarios. Now, positive outcomes are things that are desirable. They're the things that we want to happen. Um, it's not necessarily the traditional domain of risk management, um, but I know that there is a lot of interest in this area, So, uh, and I'm certainly very interested in it, which is why I, I continued with my, my thinking. Um, so positive risk, or sometimes called upside risk, uh, is concerned with events that we want to happen. So those are typical examples of the events we want to happen. So the question is, can we understand this better by modeling it or visualizing it? Um, we might need a sort of new method to do this. Um, again, I've put that in quotes, but I, this is what I call this method that I'm about to show. I call it the new method. It doesn't really have a name. Okay, so. I can see there's a lot of detail on this slide and, and the viewer isn't expected to, to look at the detail at this stage. Um, but this is an example of uh, the type of diagram that, um, that this uh, work resulted in. So this is um, essentially the reverse of a bow tie diagram. It's a diagram which reveals what I call uh, a positive risk environment. And this is an example that has been used um, in the real world. <clears throat> um, so the only time you'll see my name in this presentation is, is associated with this diagram. I don't call it a bow tie diagram because it's not. Um, a bow tie diagram is, is clearly used in, uh, in uh, downside risk, um, what I call negative risk. Um, it's used in safety engineering. It would be very confusing if we, if we refer to this type of diagram as a bow tie diagram. So I've 
put my own surname against it. Um, uh, a bit of vanity there, maybe, but um, at least it's a reference point going forward. Um, okay, so as the statement at the bottom says there on that slide, um, it enables us, this method will en enable us to create quite simple models um, or diagrams of goal focused activities. So, you know, the things that we want to do, business strategy, project delivery, or the pursuit of targets. Um, so I will now explain some of the detail behind those slides, um, and uh, the viewer will have more chance to understand how those diagrams are, are built. So diagrams of positive risk will help us to um, navigate successfully towards goals or targets, and and also to maximize the benefits that we expect those goals and targets to deliver. Two different things happening there. How do you get to the goal? And then once you've got to the goal, how do you make sure you get the benefits from the goal? Because those are, those are two different things and they're often, they're often confused, they're often put together as one thing. But it's not a matter of, um, you know, if you achieve your target, that is not the end necessarily of what you have to do. I mean, the target is there probably because it has some positive benefits, some positive outcomes, right? Uh, and so you still have to achieve those benefits even after you've hit the target. And that's why, that's one of the areas in which this bow tie type of diagram I find is very, um, very uh, useful to, to work with. And again, that should become clear in the next um, few slides. So, uh, so we've, we've already looked at how we build the traditional bow tie diagram. So now this slide will show us how I have reversed the concept to produce an upside version of the bow tie diagram. Okay, so again in the center we have the, the good event. Now on the left hand side, we don't have causes as they would be traditionally known. Um, a lot of work has gone into the left hand side of the diagram because it's, uh, it's an area definitely for some discussion and debate. Um, but the most successful uh, way of working this, I found, was to create what I call the conditions. In other words, these are the things that have to be um, delivered in order for the good event to occur. So the conditions are, uh, each of those conditions might be seen as an, uh, a necessary condition to achieve the event, but, but not sufficient on its own. So the idea is that all the conditions would have to be met for the good event to uh, occur. Um, there will be some examples of what I mean by conditions a little bit later on. Um, so that, that's, that's a difference, they're not causes. Um, you could certainly play around with the idea of using causes of good events, but it becomes quite difficult. And I think this is a, an aspect of what happens when you reverse this model, uh, turn this model around, the bow tie model, you'll find s s some things work in a very different way. However, it's still, in, in principle, it looks very similar. Now, on the right-hand side, you have effectively the, the outcomes. Instead of being negative outcomes, as they would be on a bow tie model, now they're just positive outcomes, they're benefits. So how do you how do you get to the good events and how do you ensure you get to the benefits? Well, like, again, if we take the idea of the, the bow tie model where there were controls in place to stop the flow from left to right, now we want to encourage a flow from left to right. We want to get to the benefits. We're not trying to stop getting to the um, negative outcomes. We're trying to get to those benefits. So I've created this, uh, this simple symbol, which is just a, basically an arrow shape and I call these things drivers. Um, and it's the drivers that are going to get us across to, to our benefits. Now, depending on, depending on how successful, uh, how well those drivers are implemented, how well they're performing, we, we could indicate that in, in the color. And, and that effectively starts to, to, to um, affect the risk of this environment. Because if the things you're trying to do to achieve your your goals and to achieve the benefits from those goals, if they're not performing very well, then the probability of achieving those goals and the probability of uh, achieving the benefits 
are reduced. So a typical diagram would, would show what these things are that you're going to use to get across from left to right. Um, they are essentially tasks, business tasks, business activities. Um, and I can give you a few examples now. Um, you know, a, a, dr a driver uh, might be, for example, um, running a training program. It might be analyzing some data. It might be some kind of technical solution, uh, some, some sort of documentation task, um, a communication of some kind, um, or applying a procedure. So whatever it is that you're doing within your organization to achieve your goals or to ensure you receive the benefits from having achieved those goals, these are the drivers. Okay. Um, again, it should all become much clearer as we work through these slides. Um, here's three very simple applications of this new method. Um, and this has you know, some tangible examples within it. Um, <clears throat> So in the center here, we'll have, um, we'll have an example of, of a goal. Okay? So if a business is, uh, what needs to convert to a new finance system, okay? it's like a project, project delivery, get the business onto a new finance system. So on the left-hand side, in the left-hand column, we're going to have uh, conditions. And in the right-hand column, we're going to have some benefits. So in this example, I've just shown um, three conditions. In order to convert to the new finance system, uh, you would need to uh, implement the infrastructure, you'd need to train users, all the functionality would have to be tested, etc. You could have more, obviously, more conditions than that. But all of those conditions would have to be, would have to be um, fulfilled. You, know, you, you, you don't achieve the goal just by, uh, just by uh, meeting one of those conditions. Um, and all the benefits, hopefully, will be will also be realized. Um, and again, you would probably have many more benefits when you start to do these, uh, these when you build these diagrams in a sort of workshop scenario, and people are brainstorming, you get a lot of stuff coming out. Um, and it's actually really quite interesting because you do start to discover things that you, you really hadn't thought of before, um, which is one of the benefits of, of using a sort of diagramming technique in a workshop. <clears throat> so here's another example. So your goal is to acquire a target company in a new market. So again, you would have some things that you'd have to achieve in order to, 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 uh, to get to the goal. And that's the conditions on the left-hand side. And then the benefits are on the right-hand side. And a third example, successfully launching um, an online retail site. So hopefully now this is starting to become clearer and, and self-explanatory. Um, these are limited examples because I wanted to get three on a single slide. Uh, however, you know, when you've done the brainstorming session, <clears throat> you will typically find between two or three and maybe up to about eight conditions uh, need to be satisfied to achieve the goal. Uh, on the right-hand side, you would possibly have 10, maybe even more benefits from the goal. Um, so uh, the diagrams start to take a more uneven shape than they do on this particular slide. Ah, so if I just go back there, um, I, I forgot there was one more piece of information, which is at the bottom there. Um, you can just see it says drivers are located here. So on, that, on, these, um, on these diagrams, I've not got enough space to show what the drivers might be. Um, but essentially, they'd be positioned in, the, in those spaces there between the goals and either the conditions on the left-hand side or the benefits on the right-hand side. Uh, we'll go into some more detail on the drivers fairly soon. <clears throat> right, so now um, we can slightly slightly improve the diagram. So I've added a couple more elements here. Um, at the top of the diagram there, it says risk environment descriptor. Now this is a, a convention that I'm, I'm trying to keep my diagrams as, as as close as possible to the design that's used in the bowtie method, or at least the bowtie diagrams that I've seen, which are used primarily in um, safety engineering, um, and they and they have this sort of format with this box um, above the um, above the uh, the event. Um, now I, I call this the risk environment descriptor. So basically, it's just it's it's almost like a, a title or a label for your diagram to some extent. 
So your your risk environment that you're trying to capture might might be um, something like uh, European sales and marketing. It might be research and development, or it might be mergers and acquisitions. It, it's it's the it's the broad area of your organisation's uh, activities that that the diagram fits within. Um, so that's what I call the risk environment descriptor. It's not very critical to the functioning of the diagram at all. Um, and I've also added on here, in red on the bottom right, what I call a disbenefit, which is essentially a negative outcome. Right Now, I think it's important to, to, to capture both positive and negative outcomes when you look at an event. Um, now, on the traditional bow tie diagram, when we look at a negative event, Typically, everything on the right-hand side is negative outcomes. Um, the idea of introducing a positive outcome from a bad event is something which some people find difficult to, to grasp, although theoretically it is possible. However, in, in my uh, upside model, I decided that it is important to show if there is going to be a negative outcome from your goal, because if you can show it, then you can start to do something about it. And in the case of a disbenefit, uh, what you need to do, obviously, is have controls in place. So, as you can see on that diagram, the disk benefit has two control symbols uh, between the goal and the disk benefit. The idea being that you try and prevent the disk benefit from occurring, uh, or at least you mitigate its effects through the controls. Um, so that makes, for me, a more rounded kind of diagram, because it shows that people are being are properly taking everything into consideration when they concentrate on an event. <clears throat> um, now, my my more advanced version of the diagram, which I won't be showing today, does have one or two more elements within it, um, but it tends to make slightly more complex diagrams to show and explain, and there won't be enough time to do that today. But those are all the core elements, and clearly you can start to add much more information behind each of those elements. So that's a very high-level view. So let's take the example of a project. Okay, quite simply, quite clearly, the successful delivery of a project, successful delivery is the goal. Um, and when you deliver your project, it's assumed that there are subsequent benefits. Otherwise, why would the project take place? Um, so that, to me, looks like it looks like we can use projects um, uh, and, and support projects with this type of modeling. I'll show how that's done. So let's imagine that you're just starting a major project. Um, now, clearly, there's a whole raft of methodologies and software tools out there for managing um, major projects. And I'm not trying to suggest I've got anything that, that replaces those. Um, it's not an alternative. It's something that can possibly just uh, support major projects. And where I see it being um, able to support major projects is literally on day one, where you're doing your initiate, where you're initiating the project or having a scoping exercise, where you can perhaps with the help of a whiteboard or, or or maybe a software tool if you have one, um, you could you could build a very quick diagram using my method. Now, so your project delivery, you might have decided what it is you want to, to deliver, it goes into the centre of your diagram. The best thing to do then, I think, is to talk about the benefits. Why are we doing this project? What's the purpose of it? So you brainstorm, you know, what what the benefits are going to be, and and if anyone can identify a possible uh, disbenefit as well, I think then that's great. You put that on the diagram. Um, you then might need to say, okay, so now what do we need to do to deliver this project? What are going to be the main um, deliverables? Uh, and those are going to be your con your conditions, um, which uh, you can then start to put on the left-hand side. I mean, some conditions might be, um, you know, build the infrastructure, uh, secure the funds, um, design a marketing campaign. The very high-level deliverables for that project, you can get those all down very easily, very quickly, um, on that um, on that uh, diagram uh, in the workshop, and and you've got something then gives you everyone a, a really nice, quick feel for where this project is going to go. Um, now, what I've done on this diagram, I've shown that uh, I use uh, white on symbols to, to suggest a driver or a control that hasn't actually 
started to function yet. Now, in the case of initiating a project, most activities won't have started. Um, so clearly, they'd just be shown as white. However, there might already be some activities that are you know, already functioning. So you might already need to say, OK, this, we already have this control in place, and it's going well. So we, we, can, we can color that green. We have a couple of drivers that are already functioning within the business, so we can, we can give those a status color. But essentially, the principle here is that when you're initiating a project, you don't really have much information to, 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 to evaluate um, the likelihood of success, which essentially is what the coloring of the, the drivers and the controls is, is going to help you with. Um, so the left-hand side is the focus for the project manager. They're the project tasks. The right-hand side will become the focus of the project sponsor. That's the business case. And then the senior leadership would have an interest, hopefully, in everything, particularly the cost of delivering the project and then the, the benefits uh, from the successful delivery. So, Peter, uh, uh, one question I have at this stage is, uh, what is what are the rules or guidance you provide in terms of uh, differentiating between uh, what could be a condition for delivery uh, and what could be a driver? So, for example, you know, completing the testing of uh, the software uh, could be a condition for delivery, but it could also be a driver because you know it's an activity. Uh, so are, are you able to provide to uh, the viewers uh, uh, your thinking in, in terms of how to differentiate between what could be a driver and what could be a condition for delivery? Yeah, um, that's a good question, Manoj. Uh, the, the conditions for delivery are essentially your high-level deliverables. Um, so typically, you may only end up with perhaps as many as maybe eight um, on a diagram. So that, So so successful testing of version one might be a condition for delivery. However, there are going to be many uh, tasks or activities within that. And that's what you would show as the drivers, because uh, what we like to do with the drivers is uh, assign ownership. So if, so if one of those types of testing might be user acceptance testing, another might be systems testing, you would want to show those as two separate drivers with two separate owners. Um, and of course, of course, they take place at different times or maybe even parallel sometimes. So they may have a different status as well. One may be going very well, one or maybe going very poorly. Um, so that's that's how you that's how you break it down. Um, so so your your condition is the high level deliverable and then the drivers to some extent are the tasks within it. Okay, so so condition for delivery, if we were to talk about project management, uh, could be sort of the key milestones, uh, and then the drivers are basically the activities uh, which uh, which take you to that milestone. Would that be a, a good way? Yes, to explain? you yeah. could think of them as milestones. Uh, there's there's a lot of freedom here for the for the modeler or, or for the uh, facilitator to develop the diagram as they wish. Um, uh, Milestones does imply, in my mind, um, sort of chronological flow. Um, so that might not always be the most appropriate way of looking at it. The way I've tended to do it is I look at the final delivery or the, or the, the final goal, and I just simply say, you know, what are the what are the main components of this delivery? What what were the things that had to be done to get to get here? And that becomes the that becomes the conditions. Uh, some of those might happen to be milestones, but I'm not sure if they would all be milestones. Um, but I don't want to tread too far. Into, I don't want to um, uh, go too far into the world of project management because I know it's a, such a such a vast area of, um, of, of t uh, terminology, techniques, um, um, methodologies, and and I'm, I'm just really trying to pre present something here which could be used as far as a major project is concerned. At the very beginning, just as a very almost a back of the envelope exercise, really, but it might be quite a good visual tool for doing that. Um, I think beyond this stage, then that's when all the existing techniques and tools uh, that project managers use would then come into play. Um, and I wouldn't see my method as going beyond this point within a major project. However, as I'll show in my next slide, when it comes to small projects, I think there is a role for this tool right through the life of a project. Sure. 
Okay, Peter. And uh, also, I want to see uh, how do you separate the drivers on the left of uh, the goal and the right of the goal? Could you could you uh, uh, give us a little bit more insight into the drivers on the left and the right? Uh, yeah, absolutely. It's the so the uh, yes. in, a, in in this particular example where we're talking about a project delivery as being the goal, mm -hmm. then the drivers on the left hand side are going to be the project activities, the project tasks, um, all the work that takes place um, during a project up until the point of delivery. Okay. Um, now, often when a project is is completed or is delivered, you know, there's a tendency maybe not to then think what has to happen after that to actually ensure that the project uh, delivers the benefits, because those benefits may take months or years to come about. And the people on the project team are, you know, will have moved on at that point. So the the drivers on the right hand side are the are the activities that you've identified that will need to be done, and the tasks that need to be performed in order to ensure you get those benefits. Or or in the case of in this example here, if you have a disbenefit, the the controls there are the things that you need to ensure are going to be in place to prevent the disbenefit. So those are the post project delivery activities. Um, so where there is a chronology here, it's the left-hand side is before event, and the right-hand side is after event. Okay, so if I move on to the next slide, um, this shows how I can use this tool um, with small or non-complex projects. Now, these are the sorts of things that don't traditionally or typically have an assigned project manager. Like sometimes they're not even called projects. But they are activity. They are. They are. Um, we can call them activities. They, are, they 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 take place within organisations. They usually involve a, a, a fairly large number of tasks involving a, a you know a large number of people. But perhaps because the budget isn't very large, or maybe because it's not going to take a long time, or because it doesn't have a huge business impact, it might not be given the same status as a formal project. So. Though these kinds of activities, they, they tend to be managed in a very haphazard way because quite often there isn't, a, for example, a project management tool used because um, certainly if you haven't got a project manager, the likelihood is you may not even have a proper way of controlling everything. So those kinds of activities, they, 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 can, be, they can become quite chaotic and, and sometimes very poorly managed. Um, and it would be quite useful if there was a, a tool that could give everybody a, point, a central point of reference. And if it's visual, even better, because you know there's nothing people like less than a list of things on a piece of paper, right? So it's great to be able to show things visually. So if we were to do a, uh, if we wanted to manage a small or non-complex project, um, we could, we would end up with a diagram that would be very similar, um, except that it's more of a live diagram, like an active diagram. Okay. Now. Um, uh, and my argument is that you can actually manage a project from the diagram itself. Okay, so exactly the same layout, same structure. Um, as you'll see, that some of the drivers and the controls have got colours because this is a live activity, and we're using the diagram to kind of uh, to illustrate to people how the project is going. Um, I use the colour black to imply um, a task that's completed or a driver that's completed, um, and white. Uh, to, uh, to imply something that hasn't yet started. So you, the status of activities is shown by the colour. Um, now, you'll find when I show you some uh, uh, real examples that one diagram is really quite sufficient in many cases to capture an entire project throughout its life cycle. Um, and, I, and, and I find I've I mean, I've used it myself, and I, I find it really quite useful, as do people who are working on the project or who want to get a summary view of where things are. So we need to now move away from these kind of very high-level sort of theoretical models and diagrams and start to give a, put a bit more detail on, because if we're going to do this in the real world, uh, we can't just use those very simplistic uh, diagrams. So I what I did was I took the... Uh, I took the, the symbols that are already used in the safety engineering uh, negative uh, risk bow ties and 
and I developed them, maybe changed their colour, in some cases adding one or two new shapes. And these are the these are the uh, components that I build my diagrams with. Um, quite interestingly, perhaps uh, I like to put cost into the diagram as well. So um, I use these red bars, um, uh, on, which I sh show on the right hand side. So the more red you see um, underneath the symbol, the, the more cost there is associated with it. Um, but beyond that, uh, you know, it's, hopefully it'll be fairly explanatory once people have got used to using it. Uh, certainly by the first um, first session, uh, first modeling session, first workshop, uh, I think everybody will find it very easy to use. Um, I like to show the strength of of both drivers and uh, and controls by their by their size or their width, and I and I use a simple one, two, three um, design for weak or non-essential. Uh, moderate, desirable, and strong or essential. I'm, I'll put the arrow here so you can see what, which area I'm talking about. Um, because there is clearly a difference between a relatively insignificant um, driver or relatively insignificant control and one which you might consider to be really critical. And therefore, I think it's important that the, the more critical something is, the bigger it should be, more, it's more visible. Because once you start putting colours onto things, the amount of colour you see on that diagram really should be should mean something. So you want larger, more significant drivers or larger and more significant controls to 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 be shown on the diagram um, with more colour. So particularly if they're if they're going wrong, if they're going badly wrong, and they're going red, they're turning red. The more red you see, uh, the, then the, the more it tells you something about that diagram. The idea being that the diagrams are give people a very, very quick um, and intuitive view of where of where a project might be going, or if it's not a project, if it's just a general risk environment with a goal in the center, you know, how, how well is that environment performing? Um, so that's why I've used size as being, um, you know, as, as being significant here. Again, it becomes a little bit clear when we look at a, when we look at a diagram. So as I've already said, um, the more red you see, the more concerned you should be. If you're a, particularly if you're a manager, or if you have some responsibility for a risk environment, um, so the red will imply underperformance of of uh, drivers and controls. It will imply a negative outcome, and it will also imply cost. So that's if you see red, that's what you're looking at in the diagram. So this is an uh, what I call an exemplar diagram. It simply in, it contains one example of each type of component. Um, it's just to show, uh, it's like, almost like a teaching tool as much as anything. Um, and this has been based upon uh, a, a software tool called Bowtie XP, which is one of the two or three main Bowtie modeling tools that are used, um, certainly in the safety engineering sector. Um, uh, and I've, I've been able to use that tool and then manipulate it uh, after use to create my own diagrams. But there isn't, at this point in time, a, a tool that will create these diagrams. Um, uh, now, as you'll actually see, down here on the left-hand side, in fact, there's a gray, the gray symbol. Um, this is something which I haven't captured in today's presentation, but it's, a, it's an, an additional um, symbol that can be used to enhance the quality of the diagram. Um, in my in my longer presentation, which is available online, and there will be a link to that at the end, uh, that will be explained. Um, it's known as a it's known as a positive effector, and essentially, it's something that can help to improve the performance of a driver. Um, however, I won't go into detail on that just just today. So um, that's you know that's the, what a diagram will look like when these components are added. We still need to get into some proper examples, I think, to to make it really clear to people, because uh, you may not even be able to read the details on on that diagram. Okay, so so here's a here's a diagram that I I produced um, uh, when I ran a very small project for a, a UK client, um, and it was a small project with maybe three or four people working on it. Um, it was in fact it was about it was just delivering um, some training. 
materials. Um, and it fitted quite nicely on, on a sheet of A4 paper. Um, everyone could read what the various drivers were, and they could, and the, and the ownership um, was was quite clear against each driver, <coughs> uh, and also against the controls. Um, so uh, in this case, um, there were only three conditions that we identified to deliver this goal. Um, but if I just zoom in on this one. Uh, you might be able to see a little more detail. Here we go. Okay. Uh, right. So, so this was actually delivering a um, product called RPQ, which was just a, is a basically a training program. Um, so the overall risk environment, which is this symbol, was the uh, training and education, product development and marketing. Just a very high level description of the risk environment. That's all. And like I've, I've, as I've already said, it isn't really a critical component within the diagram. Um, but wherever you see this sort of bright blue line, this is the uh, this is the ownership of each component. It's very important to have ownership of everything. Um, so that overall environment is actually owned by the director of training and education. That person, in fact, doesn't have any tasks. I don't think possibly assigned here. But it's good to know uh, who should be interested in the content in the content of this diagram. Um, so, in order to deliver this program, there were three conditions, getting the new modules ready, getting the marketing materials ready, and all the admin components had to be updated. And we just thought that was it. Those are the three broad deliverables, and within that, then there were some, essentially some activities, some tasks that had to be performed, um, and, and the tasks that had to be performed given an owner, and, and that essentially, that essentially it, it, this, what we've got here is a snapshot during the course of that project. So these white drivers hadn't started at this point in time. Um, this one was performing poorly for some reason, or it was behind schedule. Um, and because it has, because this di because this uh, driver has three uh, chevrons, it means it's, a, it's essential, critical to the delivery. Um, this, this one down below has only two chevrons. Uh, I'm losing my arrow, unfortunately. <laughs> this one here has two chevrons, which means it's, I was just perceived as being slightly less critical. But um, I wouldn't get too hung up on, on that. But it's, as you can see, it's quite useful to be able to see the difference between the things which are deemed to be more important and those which are deemed to be less important, because they do show up stronger with their colors. Um, and, and then over on the right-hand side, we identified a number of benefits to releasing this new training program. So down on the bottom right here, we have two negative outcomes or possible negative outcomes from this um, delivery. So we identified some um, controls that could be put in place. Um, now they may not be controls, perhaps as a as a traditional risk auditor might recognise them. But they are the things that you could do to mitigate or prevent a negative outcome. That's that's really how they're used in this this type of diagram. And if we just come back out of here <coughs> and move on to just another quick example, um, I won't go into any detail on this one. But this was uh, a project to achieve financial integration of an American subsidiary business, right? So it was a relatively small finance project uh, for a fairly small. Um, American company with about 30 staff, I think, um, and bringing them into a much larger company. Um, and it was just a matter of um, basically doing things like training their staff to use the new uh, finance system, making uh, transferring all their data over to the new to the um, the main corporate finance system. These kinds of activities. Again, what would be classed as a small project, it might not even be given a project manager. In this case, it was just going to be run by one of the IT personnel, um, and it created a diagram which, again, would print on a sheet of A4 paper, and it would be readable on a sheet of A4 paper. Um, it can be updated on a daily basis or even an hourly basis if you wanted to, and it can be easily shared with people. And in actual fact, it captures you know enough information perhaps for most people just to to run a small, non-complex project with. Um, no doubt there would be other supplementary materials around, but 
most people will be quite happy just referring back to this diagram to understand what they have to do, what's been done, what needs to be done, what the current status of activities are. And clearly, you know, when, when the more red you're going to see, the more concerns you might have, particularly when it comes to drivers or controls, because that affects the likelihood of things being successful. So therefore, it affects the risk. Okay, um, and, and, and that's you know, this is the use of this word risk uh, causes all kinds of problems for people. But I, but I, I like to, I like to see that it can be applied perfectly well in an upside world. And, and we're just here we're, here, we're just talking about the risk of success as opposed to the risk of failure. <clears throat> so, Peter, in your uh, experience with customers, uh, when you've used this diagram, uh, what was the business need uh, for uh, visualizing the information in, in uh, this type of a diagram format that were, were, were they mainly looking uh, for some sort of reporting or monitoring or tracking? Uh, tool for their projects. Uh, I, I just want to understand here yeah, what what was the business need to uh, to which this diagram you know was then the answer. Okay. Um, well, just to begin with, um, I started with a uh, you could call it a workshop, but in fact I sat down with um, the main IT in this in the case of this diagram uh, this model mm -hmm. um, the main IT guy. In fact, it was the IT manager. And, and he knew everything that had to be done. It was all in his head. And and I I was able to get the Bowtie XP software, which is the, the safety engineering software, on the screen. And although the symbols are, are not correct on the uh, on the traditional Bowtie model, he understood that. Um, and and I was able to at least use the the tool to to to, to brainstorm the drivers and the and the conditions and the benefits with him in the room. So we, firstly, we were able to produce the outline of the diagram. Um, I was then able to take it away, and I had to manipulate the graphics to make it look like my type of diagram. Mm -hmm. And then I was able to, to basically then not only share it with the, with the IT manager, who was going to be doing a lot of the tasks himself, and he found it a useful reference point. Um, I was being asked just to coordinate this project along with other activities. So I wasn't a full-time project manager, it was, I was just being asked to, to coordinate it. So I, I took ownership of this diagram and I maintained it. And then one of the project sponsors was one of the directors of the business. And so I was able to send it to him uh, from time to time or send him a link to, so he could look at it, which was enough information for him. He didn't need any more detail than that. Um, and he, he also was familiar with bow tie diagrams, so therefore he, he got the idea he got the concept that I was reversing it and using a good event as the event rather than a bad event as the event. So, for people who are familiar with bow tie models, it's a, it's very quick and easy to use. Mm -hmm. um, it would be easy to uh, to roll this out into the downside risk management world because where people are familiar with the bow tie diagram, they would have much difficulty recognizing what this is doing. Um, a little bit more work needed for people who are not familiar with it. But it's a great reporting tool. Yeah, it gives just as much, just enough information for most people, um, and that's that. And so that it, it was successful in that in that regard. It was only seen by a few people. Um, it didn't have a long life, but it was a proof of concept from my perspective. Yeah. So so in this case, then uh, the two business need uh, I can see where uh, this would be a good solution would be. Uh, that if you are initially in the planning phase uh, and then you want to see what needs to be done, so it can be a visual planning tool in terms of what may be needed. Uh, yes. And also from a monitoring perspective where you want to monitor uh, how the events are unfolding on an ongoing basis, then this could also be a good visual monitoring tool. So it's a good alternative to you know, maybe some, some dull Excel reports uh, sponsors may get. Uh, in terms of how these events are unfolding, it, it'll be—it's a better way to present the same information visually. Yes, absolutely. It's—it's it's, it's actually killing a few birds with a single stone. It does achieve a number of different things, and it's perhaps uh, any, any uh, people who are watching this podcast who who have been maybe working in risk management for a long time, they may be saying, "What's this got to do with risk management?" Um, and 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 it's fair to say that the 
the risk management aspect of this is only one part of it. Um, but clearly, in relation to risk management, what this is going to be showing you is where, where there is uh, where there is underperformance and where there is um, acceptable performance and where there is good performance. And that will that's affecting your probabilities of success um, and, uh, and probabilities of, of achieving the, the benefits. So from a risk management perspective, what you are looking at here is, is performance, performance of drivers and controls. Whereas if you're looking at it from, say, a project sponsor's point of view, you might be interested just in making sure that all those benefits have been like, properly identified and that and the things are being done to ensure we get those benefits. Um, so different people will look at it and see different things into it. It's not only a risk management tool, but clearly it can be used in that in that regard. And from a risk assurance perspective, when I used to work in risk assurance, and we, all we ever did was look at controls and negative negative outcomes and you know the bad stuff. Um, I could well imagine a risk management team or risk assurance team being given a diagram like this and told, go out and audit the drivers. Go out and, and make sure that these things are performing correctly, performing effectively. If stuff is, is being shown as red, you know, go out and, and, and do the audit. Or maybe even in order to get to get the diagram up to date and to get the colours correct on the diagram, maybe it needs to be audited anyway. So so I could see a different way of doing risk assurance, which is not only going after the controls, but it's also going after the drivers, looking at the drivers. I know that does happen in some places, but it doesn't happen everywhere, let's face it. Um, and if I was if I was working, if I was an auditor, my job would be much more interesting if I could spend half of my time looking at controls and half of my time looking at the drivers in the business. Because um, it gives me both the upside and the downside perspective on the company. And I think that's much more refreshing and much more interesting uh, for somebody working in that area. Yeah, and and I, I definitely I see see uh, from from risk management perspective that there is there is a, a lot of good uh, fresh thinking here, Peter. Where uh, in in two ways, you know, where first it is allowing uh, it is giving risk managers a model to also help organizations maximize the opportunities, and and that's where you know risk manage risk management can add value, where it's actually helping organization achieve the business objective rather than yeah, just always trying to prevent the threats uh, from happening. Uh, and it's also bringing a visual element, you know, which is also typically missing uh, from risk reporting and, and risk management work where you work with a lot of Excel spreadsheets and uh, text. Uh, and I think some sort of a visual way of actually representing the different elements of your opportunities uh, is is another, you know, sort of great fresh thinking here, which, which could only benefit uh, risk managers in terms of communicating how they are helping the organization to maximize uh, those opportunities. Yes, good. Yeah, thanks, Manoj. That's a good summary. And uh, uh, and I've used this slide. I've moved on to this slide because, in fact, it, it tries to it tries to show that there is a relationship between these two ways of looking up at um, the traditional bow tie method. And and it's symmetrical and it's quite simple. And people can should be able to get it quite easily. And the, the role of risk management is, is, is focused around uncertainty, whether it be negative downside or whether it be positive or upside. And where the bow tie method, which is the diagram on the left hand side here, where that has a role in risk management uh, and is, and is, and is um, proven and uh, recognized, then I don't see why. The, the diagram on the right hand side shouldn't have equivalent value. Um, it's not going to satisfy everybody and it's not going to resolve every type of risk management problem, but it's it's a tool that can be used in some circumstances to to either help or or in some cases to provide a total solution. Um, and and I think that symmetry uh, gives it some degree of validation. If, if, if the bow tie method didn't exist and I just invented this method, then people would question it much more, uh, I think, because they'd be saying, well, it's totally unproven. But I think because the bow tie method is proven, then if, if all you do is turn it around 180 degrees, then I, 
then in theory, uh, this other method should, should also be acceptable. Um, so that's what that diagram is trying to show. Um, just very briefly now, then if you start to extend this idea, um, I have something called the satellite view, which basically means that if you strip out the detail and you just leave the symbols and their colors, then you end up with something which is a real snapshot of the status of a risk environment or particularly of a particular diagram, particular goal that you're trying to achieve or a particular target or a particular project deliverable, which might be as much as anybody needs to see to know where things are going. If you're if you're if you're if you're, if you're on the top floor and you're you know you're in the directors um, <clears throat> in the boardroom or somewhere, that's maybe as much as you need to know, right? So it's kind of quite nice because you can you can literally in the space of you know in a on a, a mobile phone screen you could almost get a snapshot as to where this project has got to, um, and that's kind of shown on this next slide here really, which basically shows. Uh, that this tool will comprehensively, comprehensively visualize any objective. Um, that's just uh, the exemplar diagram I showed earlier. Uh, you can initiate and scope a project. Uh, very simple, straightforward <coughs> uh, workshop tool. Um, you can actually manage a small project from a diagram, which I've done on a couple of occasions, and I gave um, showed you some examples. Um, and you can even update management you know, with literally with just the symbols and the colors uh, in a matter of seconds. And that might be as much detail as people need. You can always provide a link so they can go and look at the diagram if they want to. And if there was a software tool uh, behind that diagram, then you could also have the ability to drill into the diagram, click on symbols and, and actually see more detail as to what's going on. So the question now is really, is this a, is this a tool for decision makers? Is it something that could be useful? Um, you know, personally, I think it could be. I would love to be able to use this with my clients. Um, so, you know, uh, that's something for the for the viewers to think about. Um, I can see it being particularly attractive to business consultants and management consultants as they love these kinds of tools. Um, and, the, and sometimes the simpler the better, so that they don't take too much time to to work through and to learn. Um, I won't read through these, but basically, I've had a lot of response from around the world. Um, uh, most people being very positive, but no one's really been negative about this. Um, but uh, you know, I, I, sometimes people don't want to be negative, so you only really hear the positive stuff. So that isn't necessarily a full endorsement. That's great, Peter. Thank you very much again uh, for coming into our episode today and sharing this new methodology uh, with our viewers. Uh, it's not every day that we get to hear some fresh thinking uh, in terms of risk management. Uh, so it's been a real pleasure uh, to hear your ideas and your new methodologies. And I hope the viewers uh, would also take these ideas and benefit uh, from them by applying them into their day-to-day -day risk management activities. So thank you very much, Peter.